Okay, so uh, if we could get to that point, then we would be back um, to being able to assemble this kind of, of, of uh, model system, a, a model protocell, composed of uh, a membrane, uh, compartment boundary, and uh, replicating genetic material uh, on the inside. Okay, now when we're thinking of a complex uh, uh, composite system like this, the, the question often arises as to well, why really bother with the membrane compartment? Why not just let the RNA molecules replicate in solution? And uh, one way of thinking about that is that for Darwinian evolution to emerge, molecules that are in some way better than their neighbors have to have an advantage for themselves. So if we think about uh, RNA replicases floating around in solution, so these would be RNA molecules that catalyze the replication of another RNA molecule, it doesn't really help if you have a mutation which is uh, faster or more accurate if all it's doing is copying random other RNAs that it bumps into uh, in solution. It has to have an advantage uh, for itself. And the simplest way to imagine that happening is to encapsulate these molecules within a vesicle uh, so that they're always copying molecules that are related by descent. Okay. Now, uh, the self-assembly of these kinds of complex uh, structures is something that's actually quite simple. Uh, so at the lowest uh, level, the formation of a membrane vesicle can just encapsulate whatever is there in the surrounding solution. However, it's intriguing that there are ways of making the process more efficient, and uh, one of the most interesting ways of doing that is to take advantage of that same clay mineral, montmorillonite, that we've already seen can catalyze the assembly of RNA strands. And so what you can see in this picture uh, which was generated by uh, uh, Shelley Fujikawa and Marty Hanchuk when they were in my lab about eight years ago. Uh, what you can see is that we have here a clay particle uh, which uh, has RNA molecules bound to its surface, so the orange color is, is a dilabeled RNA. And it turns out these clay particles can catalyze the assembly of membrane uh, sheets from uh, fatty acids. And what's happened here is that this clay particle has catalyzed the assembly of this uh, large uh, surrounding vesicle uh, as well as the many smaller vesicles encapsulated within. So what we now can see is that a single very uh, common abundant mineral can catalyze the assembly of a genetic material. It can catalyze the assembly of compartment boundaries, cell membranes and it can help bring them together. So very intriguing as a way of simplifying the assembly of cell-like structures on the early Earth. Uh, here's another uh, picture, clay particle inside uh, a vesicle. Uh, here uh, the boundary is quite uh, dramatically evident. So this is a stack of many layers of, bi of membrane bilayers. Uh, here's yet another example where the a uh, large outer vesicle is filled with hundreds of, of smaller vesicles, all assembled under the catalytic influence of this uh, clay particle in the middle. Okay. So uh, assembling these things looks fairly simple. What about the process of growth and division? After all, that's what we really need to generate cell-like structures that can propagate. And uh, at this point, what I can say is that we've come up with a process that looks fairly uh, robust. Uh, we can start with uh, vesicles, add food in the form of fatty acid micelles. They grow remarkably into filamentous structures, which can then divide very easily into daughter cells. And this generates a cycle uh, that can go around and around indefinitely. And in the uh, next part of this lecture, I'll go into much more detail about the nature of this process and the mechanism by which this happens. Okay, but uh, putting this cycle together with uh, our thinking about nucleic acid replication, we can actually start to imagine what a primitive cell cycle would have looked like. And so this is shown in this uh, figure from a Scientific American article uh, that I wrote with Alonzo Ricardo from my lab. And it summarizes some of our ideas about the ways in which 
the early Earth environment might help to drive uh, cell growth and division. So the idea is that the general environment should be rather cold, perhaps uh, even an ice-covered uh, pond, uh, something you might find in, a, in an Arctic or an Alpine environment. Uh, there are many examples on the modern Earth. Uh, the reason for wanting a cold environment in general is that the copying chemistry uh, seems to go better uh, at low temperatures. The low temperature helps the building blocks to bind to the template and facilitates the copying process. But then we know that eventually, if, once copying is complete, you have to get the strands apart so that you can undergo another round of copying. Simplest way for that to happen is to invoke high temperatures. And so what we like to think about are convection cells uh, driven by uh, geothermal energy. So essentially in a hot spring type of environment, uh, that you could have a pond that's mostly cold, but every now and then these particles would get caught up in a plume of hot water rising from a, a hot spring. Uh, they'd be transiently exposed to high temperatures. That would result in uh, strand separation. It also allows for a rapid influx of nutrients from the environment uh, to feed growth and replication through the next round. Uh, and then that would generate uh, a cycle in which the whole entire process of growth and replication and division is driven by fluctuations in the environment. Uh, this is driving us to, uh, to talk to geologists and to search for analogs of this kind of environment on the modern Earth. Uh, here is a beautiful image of an Antarctic lake uh, uh, in which you see stromatolites. These, these mounds here are microbial growths on the surface. Uh, and the reason that it's liquid is that, of course, there is heat rising up uh, from, from below geothermally. Um, so it's not a perfect analog of the scenario I described. We would like to find environments like this where there are hot springs generating convection cells that could drive the whole cycle. Uh, so that would be very uh, satisfying if we could identify such environments.